Hi, Francisco. Thanks for joining me, friend. Thanks for having me. Been really looking forward to this for some time. And uh, yeah, I think for a lot of this conversation, we'll talk about this incredible diagram that you have uh, made, which I happen to have on a second monitor here. And I, I guess you've got up as well. Um, but of course, as I always do, I'll start by asking you about your life story. And uh, just to give you a little bit of context about why I like to ask that question, um, I think primarily for me at this point, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of things that I'm interested in, like specific topics, and we'll get to talk about a lot of those things today. But what I'm fundamentally interested in and what I want to discover and uh, connect to on the show is who people are individually. I think people are just incredible. Uh, every person I meet is almost like a, a singular piece of art. You know, it's like there's only one of this person. And if you really pay attention to someone and listen to them and talk to them, um, you can get to this quality of, you know, art or beauty or, or significance with each person. And so I want this show to be about connecting to that with a specific person and really seeing for myself and sharing with the world what that is about a certain person, almost like painting a portrait of who they are, uh, but through conversation rather than visual art. And um, so for that purpose, I really like to ask people, you know, what's your life story? What What's happened so far in your life? And I think that often sort of seeds the conversation with uh, a lot of context that's really helpful for like, how did you even come to be interested in the specific topics that we're talking about anyway? And like, how do those fit into your larger life? So yeah, with that sort of context in place, I would love to ask you about your life and what's happened to you so far and how you got to be here today. Yeah, thanks for asking. Well, let's see. Where would be a good place to start? Okay, so probably with uh, me getting uh, on my dad's computer and becoming terminally online like instantly, uh -huh. <laughs> I I was really into, I was really into Pokemon, so um, I went I started frequenting like these Pokemon forums, Portuguese Pokemon forums, uh, online, and that got me into you know computers and games and making hack ROMs of Pokemon, um, and you know I I, I guess that, that that's like a, a piece of my like preteen uh, era that I'm particularly fond of. And um, yeah, let's see. In, ter in terms of how this relates to what we're gonna be talking about, uh, I guess um, this seeds my interest in computers. And you know, when I'm, I I've always been really interested in uh, philosophy, like through my teens. So I was like, between like physics engineering and computer science when I was going into college. Um, and I figured computer science was, you know, the most philosophical uh, engineering, almost like applied philosophy. Um, so I did that. Oh yeah, because I read Logic Comics as well, which is um, this graphic novel that follows uh, Bertrand Russell on his quest to write the Principia Mathematica and visiting all these 20th century mathematicians uh culminating with the invention of the computer like that's what an epic story uh anyway uh you know i get into computer science um with an interest in philosophy i'm also you know experimenting with psychedelics at this time uh when i go into college um Oh yeah, uh, studying like machine learning and, and you know statistical learning uh, in general sort of unlocked um, what what intuition uh, could be or like unlocked intuition as a plausible thing. Where previously, you know, uh, I was sort of this hardcore you know Cartesian uh, rationalist where all, all all that can be known uh, is like propositional logical statements and nothing else. Right. Uh, <laughs> this was me in college, okay, uh, mm -hmm. in early college. Uh, so, you know, uh, learning about machine learning and, and okay, the computer can't define a cat, right? The computer isn't defining uh, 
like the, the cat dog classifier isn't defining the features that make up a dog uh without a shadow of a doubt so you know i guess fuzzy knowledge <laughs> exists right um so that's sort of that plus you know psychedelics plus being reading uh philosophy and you know uh I, I was like reading Jung and some like evolutionary psychology at the same time. And it, it, it sort of just clicked that, okay, wait, it's not just intuition, you know, like a, a lot of, a lot of the stuff that people talk about as uh, magic or spiritual stuff um, can, you know, probably be grounded uh, in terms of um, operations on subtle information that we're just, you know, processing with something other than our propositional logical sort of little engine um so yeah that, that just opened up like that blew the world open for me in terms of you know everything's interesting everything can be like everything has to be reinterpreted in light of these uh of these like insights or lenses anyway um what happened after that yeah uh, I lived in China for a semester, uh, doing like a, a semester abroad kind of thing. Um, learning Chinese was really fun. Um, I was there in 2019, so I came back into the COVID era. Um, and, you know, I, I was really busy at that time. Uh, I was also starting to be on Teapot uh, a lot. Teapot, like on Twitter and, you know, sort of post ready type Twitter people read Ribbon Farm and David Chapman and stuff and the, the community sort of started coalescing around these blogs and these ideas. Um, what else? Oh yeah, uh, you know, COVID, I was writing my thesis on aligning recommender systems to society because they're not at the moment. Um, I was also building Thread Helper uh, with Rival Voices, uh, who I met on Twitter. And um, after that, after Thread Helper, so we we got we got two emergent ventures grants to build Thread Helper, but then we failed to like get traction as a startup. So we just you know left it in its current state. It's still usable, probably not for long, uh, because of Google and Twitter API um shenanigans but yeah after that i i built i mean i helped uh, uh build unigraph which was um uh, a graph database workspace uh, it was like open source local first it was meant to aggregate all your data from a bunch of places and let you do you know operations on it uh, it was it had like algebraic data types so you could compose the types and anyway just mess with your data um all in one place uh, and yeah so there's this <laughs> there's this side of me that's really into knowledge management because i've always been trying to, to you know crystallize not crystallize but you know get the big picture access uh you know some big picture some like elegant model that explains a you know way more than it should um and you know i'm always looking for these abstractions and for these insights and knowledge management is a big part of that because that's uh, you know you get to a point where you read so much that you lose track of what you're reading or you know you have so many uh insights that you then forget so you start want to cataloging them um so you know i guess that's what's sort of behind the drive for both thread helper and unigraph and and you know my sort of database um, exploits. I guess. Um, what else? Unigraph, Unigraph, Unigraph. Yeah. Th then I I, I had a couple uh, odd jobs because I got out of college after I, I wrote my thesis. I've been working on you know stuff related to local first and knowledge management. And then um, last year I started. Oh, yeah, there was Vibe Camp, which was really cool. Uh, I went to the US for the first time. We um, took a road trip from Texas to New York, which was really nice. 
Um, and then I, you know, I was, I've been studying machine learning in college, but I, I didn't really have a job doing it. And I sort of wanted to prove to myself that I could. So I started, you know, doing interview prep and interviewing with ML companies. Uh, and I've been um, contracting as a research engineer for um, like, what, four or five months now, um, you know, uh, getting a bit of money. Uh, and like I said, sort of proving to myself that, that I can do the job, even though it's not necessarily what's feeling most alive in terms of what, what I think I should be doing or, or what would be like of most service. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about that. Excellent. Um, yeah. I'm curious to dive into the chapter in your childhood and about Pokemon and what, what do you think resonated for you about that wow. as a kid? That's interesting. I guess a lot of kids resonate with Pokemon. Mm -hmm. um, so the um, you know them just being creatures and there being a bunch of them uh kids have kids have this like really good cataloging impulse uh you know you you learn the names for things really fast and because you know you need to keep track of all the animals or, or of all the plant species uh and you need to get this knowledge up to speed uh pretty quickly quickly you know evolutionarily speaking um so you know that's fun then the aspect of evolution you know like stuff progressing the the creatures becoming uh cooler and stronger the fact that it's elemental as well uh you know you have fire types water types etc um yeah <laughs> uh it, i don't know it, it just feels appealing uh and then i found i found the um, the online forum because um i was looking for Pokemon fusions, like I wanted a website that would let me fuse two Pokemon to po to Pokemon. And I, I, at the time, this was, you know, impossible, really, like having software that would do this was just, you know, there's no way. Uh, but me as a kid, uh, didn't know that. Uh, but people did make fusions uh, by hand, like people would, you know, do pixel art. And, you know, I got into it and that's how I got into the the Pokemon forum uh, doing pixel art. Um, but now you can, oh my God, image models can actually fuse Pokemon like, and they're good. <laughs> uh, th that, that, that filled like a hole in my, you know, child self or something. You know, I, I did feel complete when somewhat, when I saw that happening for the first time. Amazing. What was it like for you participating in those forums? Uh, it was surprisingly formative because I was like 11 years old when I joined and most people were like 16. So I was just talking to these older kids um, online um, who I thought were the coolest, but were probably like the nerdiest of the nerdy types uh, to be hanging out on a Pokemon forum all day. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I I made friends that lasted for many years, actually. Uh, I don't think I speak to, to many of them anymore, or any, um, but, but they lasted for longer than the forum did. So, you know. That, that was my first sort of version of online community. Hmm. Were there other online communities that you were in over the years? Not to that extent uh, until Twitter happened, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let's say. And Twitter's much larger than, than what the Pokemon forum was for me which is saying a lot like my parents knew about the forum and, and you know stuff that happened on mm. it uh, like this time the the twitter thing that you know I, I hate the name teapot but in group like the friends we made on twitter like it just feels 
I don't know. I, I feel a devotion to it. Like, you know, um, so, sort of like being in love. You, you think you think about them every day. Uh, you know, all the time you keep thinking about ways to, you know, make thing be things better, surprise them, um, etc. Right? It, it just feels like a, a relationship to, you know, not a group, but like the sort of egregore of the group. What do you think it is that makes you feel devoted to this particular community? So, <clears throat> so like using the word community, um, I'm not sure about it. Uh, like I, I do have community uh, online, but I, I'm not sure if like community is the right place to the, the right name to give the thing that's bounded by what we call in group or teapot or whatever, because, you know, people will argue there's many communities or, you know, it's a. I, sorry. Um, yeah, people will argue there are like many communities or many tribes and, you know, it's it's just a mindset or it's just um, a set of assumptions or a set of norms uh, or that plus a sense of being in a place that's given to you by Twitter that recommends stuff in sort of um, according to like ne network proximity. So there's a, a topological element to it. Anyway, um, what about it that makes me devoted? Um, I just think everyone's really bright and kind uh, at the same time. Like, um, obviously, you know, uh, I share a million interests uh, with a million different people. And the cool thing is, th these aren't just, you know, software engineers, although probably that's the majority. Um, you know, you have, you have, artists, you have, you know, non-technical philosopher people, you have uh, meditators and people who describe their interests as primarily spiritual. You have, you know, really technical hackers that, you know, still hang out with uh, all of these people. And, you know, the picture of, um, of the elephant when everybody, you, there's a bunch of people around the elephant with <laughs> blindfolds. It's like, this, it's a snake uh, or it's a tree trunk. Um, yeah, so I'd say like if the elephant is like the sacred or, or you know, some, something approaching that, like all these people are sort of holding the different parts of the elephant, mm -hmm. right? And we're just discovering uh, together, you know, how, how each of our parts fit. And it's beautiful. It's like, it's, you know, extremely exciting. Mm. It, it, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel, um, trivial is not the word I'm looking for, but inconsequential, right? It's not like we have all these interests and, oh, oh you know, we're pretty little interests that no one cares about but me, or like, you know, uh, we care about them the same way a fandom does. Uh, which means, you know, okay, it's a fandom. No, it's like people have projects in the real world and people are collaborating and people are, you know, finding partners and starting families and starting companies. Uh, and it just, it feels like grabbing like reality, uh, like getting traction on reality, right? It's, it just feels real <laughs> and powerful. Well, I suspect we might come back to talking about teapot or group or whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, one other question I wanted to ask you about is uh, if you look back on your time at working on Thread Helper and later on Unigraph, like how would you say you grew personally through working on those projects? Mm. Grew personally. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff you don't think about uh, uh, with regards to projects and you know doing things. There's a lot of stuff that you don't think about until you're actually in it. 
Um, let's see. Um, you know, one obvious thing is never having had uh, a serious like software uh, product. Um, there's a lot of stuff in software and in releasing a product that is not, you know, you you make the main you build the main feature, uh, but that's like ten percent of the thing. Uh, you know, the the other ninety percent is. Um, CI and uh, making it compatible with many platforms and you know a bunch of edge cases and uh, making the architecture nice and extendable uh, and then publishing and then you and then you you know that's like after all of that it's like you know twenty percent or something and then eighty percent is like okay but you still don't have mar product market fit and now you need to interview users and. Uh, you know, make radical changes, probably pivot because actually it's not, you know, actually it doesn't solve a problem anyone has. Um, or, you know, it would take 10, 10x as much time or money than you have. So, yeah, there, there's, this, there's this sort of intangible intuition for how how hard things are for example right i feel like i got much humbler um but at the same time better at spotting like opportunities for you know quick and easy interventions uh that don't require all the um scaffolding and overhead or like that require minimal versions of that Also, I don't think I have a great relationship to work. I, I think I'll obsess it, obsess over it for, for long, uh, and then I'll feel tired and exhausted and won't feel like working for some time. So you know, prone to burning out. Mm. 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 It's getting better. Well, let's dive into talking about this diagram, and I'll make sure to share this in the show notes so people can look at it as well. Um, I just want to ask first, before we dive into any particular part of it, uh, what sort of precipitated you making this diagram, and like, why did you make it? Okay. <clears throat> like I said, I have this sort of ongoing synthesis impulse right i'm i'm feeling the elephant and i i feel the elephant from different directions and i have many interests because i feel the elephant in in each of the in each of those interests uh but it's i don't i'm not good at explaining to you how they connect uh or at least i'm not good at it every day uh but i am some days and i was in the shower uh and i was you know shower showering as you do in the shower <laughs> and um yeah i just got out of the shower picked up a big piece of paper like an a3 piece of paper or a2 uh and started sketching the diagram because you know something in my head went boop, 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 boop. oh wait okay i'm seeing how a lot of these pieces connect uh just yeah so paper uh i made like a a primitive version of the of the diagram that you have uh, and then visa recommended the software and i i fleshed out the diagram a bit more uh, on scapel i think is the name uh, yeah i i, I think i want to say that you know I, I really like the diagram as a sort of map of my own interests or sort of like a, a snapshot of my understanding of the elephant uh, at the time, but it's like, I really wish it could be like a formal thing that could help more people, but it, but it, it's really not, uh, or at, le at least not as it stands. Um, so yeah, like it's, I've called it like a, the snapshot of the thing, I've called it like a quest map of teapot, 
uh, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that people are working on that, and maybe they'll realize how, how it connects and maybe this could be, you know, help them be like, oh, okay, this sort of connects, or at least uh, Francisco, she thinks uh, it does. But yeah, it's it's mostly a me thing, uh, I, I guess. It, it's mostly a memory aid for, for me. Yeah, well, I would hope that this conversation would make it more legible, at least to me, but also mm -hmm. to other people. I mean, I see a lot of seeds of really powerful connections here that, you know, this has intrigued me basically since I've seen it. So, um, and we had that nice conversation in the Bay a few months ago where we got to talk a bit about it. And um, yeah, um, one question about it, again, at this sort of like zoomed out level as well as um, you described it when you posted it. Uh, as unhinged inspired moment where I mapped high level interdependence of the things that seem relevant in the path from human experience to human flourishing in deep time V2. Um, yes. What does that mean? What do you mean? Isn't it obvious? Uh, okay, let's see. Um, ba -ba -ba. I I'm just going to bring up the sentence because I forgot. Okay. Um, unhinged inspired moment so it's like inspired moment because I got out of the shower unhinged because you know I forewent any pretensions to it being systematic or grounded or interpretable by anyone but me um, high level interdependence I guess is self-explanatory things that seem relevant in the path from human experience to human flourishing is probably the key part I guess so, um, you can, so one of the ways of interpreting this diagram or like the, one of the central things that you probably need to, to read this is that um, I see, you know, I see sort of the world as an information processing thing. Um, and um, and problems in the world. So like, you know, you'll be going about your day in the world, you'll see some injustice or something that works poorly and you'll feel compelled to fix it. You know, you wish, you wish this was better. And, and these sorts of problems are sort of um, distortions in the information processing. Uh, and, you know, okay, information processing, organism thing but you know where's it coming from and where's it going um what wh well where it's coming from um is experience right it's um you can you can say that you know in the human system like all information that enters this system you know the whole of humanity the whole world machine is like you know goes in through your phenomenology right like empirical knowledge is great uh but you know you get the empirical knowledge from your phenomenology still right um the the thing that makes it empirical is that other people's phenomenology will probably agree with you um but <clears throat> so I, I, I find this really elegant. So it's like, um, you know, consciousness, the, the like qualia pocket that QRI described, like the topologically bounded, uh, you know, bag of qualia, or, you know, you can call it just your experience is, you know, the information that you have available at any, any given time. And then it's, it gets propagated, right? Like your brain does a bunch of transformations to it um that you know you aggregate um you know visual points into you know um, the limited entities entities are mapped to uh concepts that have like language represent language labels tags um and you know th then you do a bunch of transformations on them some like intuitive like uh, on a fuzzy level stuff is getting like sloshed around and you know is this compatible no like we scratch 
uh, is this compatible? Yes. And they sort of uh, in, in intertwine or cancel out or uh, however you visualize it. And others are like propositional and logical and you do these transformations um, on the concept and then it gets propagated you know, up a level when you try to communicate these things or when you act in the world and your actions in the world are interpreted by others. Um, and, you know, then you can ag aggregate, um, you can aggregate humans at different scales and th that's the scales thing that's in the diagram. Um, rich, rich decibels, uh, micro solidarity thing has also uh, a scales framework. I didn't know about it until I started this, but um, you know, it's very much the same thing or, or it's it's so close that I, I just started using some of his terms. Anyway, you can aggregate people uh, at different scales and, and you can interpret each aggregation uh, at each scale as, you know, one like information processing unit. So you'll have like a diet uh, of two people, uh, that have like a, a relationship and, and really high context and um, it makes sense to, um, to interpret them as, you know, one information processing unit thing, you know, in squads, like around five people uh, works for families or for like early stage startups or teams like squad teams. Uh, and then, you know, uh, squads uh, or families you know, used to go to church uh, and you can interpret uh, one congregation around like one church as um, another information uh, processing um, entity like people do model thinking um, by you know going to listen to the same stories and singing together um, and you know the, a scale up of that could be like the the city scale or like a big company uh, scale. <clears throat> and you can probably go above that, but you know, I guess we can talk about it more. Um, yeah, let's come back to the scale thing. I, I wanna ask about, um, you know, you said you started that by saying that you see the world as an inf information processing, almost like organism. And I'm curious, how did you come to see the world that way? That's a great question. Um, I guess I'm I'm always looking for sort of the frame that makes the most sense, right? The frame that explains the most while being like maximally uh, elegant. Uh, and it just it just seems like the information processing uh, thing probably is the most general, because um, like you know. Computation is, you can look at computation as like the study of change, right? You have a state, you have a process and you have uh, a different state. <clears throat> and um, it, information is also pretty fundamental. Uh, you know, you can describe any state as information. And I was really excited when I, when I learned that information is physical, um, literally, like um, there's Landauer's principle uh, that I, I learned this in a like quantum information uh, class, but if you delete, if you delete information, like if you make it, if you make a string of bits pass through, um, like non-reversible operation, like an or, uh, or an end, uh, where you know, two bits go in, one bit, one bit goes out. Like there's multiple possible inputs that could have, uh, that could generate a zero or a one on the other end. Um, so you know, you delete information, and heat is released when you delete information, like extra heat that you know the changing of the transistors uh, doesn't account for. Uh, Right, so that was just beautiful, and you know, I'm not, I'm not a physicist. Uh, I don't have a, I, I don't even have any ambition uh, of being like, you know, saying interesting things at the level of physics. But it's like, okay, this this 
makes it plausible enough that you know information is actually pretty fundamental and let's see yeah like thinking about stuff as um information processing is just general um i guess if you have like follow-up questions to this maybe this can help me like, mm -hmm. focus yeah what were some of the um uh, influences on that way of seeing cool influences so obviously you know uh I'm a computer scientist, so I just I just find find the rich the richest metaphors um, in computer science. Like there's a million, right? Like there's because again, since it's the study of change and it deals with like information, which could be encoding anything, um, it sort of generalizes a lot of insights that we've had before computer science was a thing. Like all the techniques, uh, all the all the concepts, end up being generalized into like algorithms and encodings for things. Like I don't know, a BFS uh, versus a DFS, right? A breadth first search versus a a depth first search. Um, go, going deep or going wide. Uh, that applies to you know anything in life, but you learn it in the context of computers and, and doing algorithms. So, you know, CS, obviously. Um, Wolfram physics. So a lot of people don't like Wolfram. And I'm, again, I'm not in a position to like defend them because again, I don't think I know enough about physics, but the visuals for that thing, uh, I, I don't know if you've seen them. Some, uh, yeah. Yeah, like the, um, the graphs and how they become how you can approximate Hilbert spaces. So like Cartesian, like spaces with like Cartesian <clears throat> coordinates on the graphs and like the shape, <clears throat> the shape they take up. And for some reason, these graphs just match my mental representation of things, right? Like if I think of things at a low, at a low level, like at a very low level, they look like those graphs dancing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, let's dive into some particulars on this um, diagram. You talked before about scale and that, that goes from self and body emotion to global and post-human. Um, what are the sort of... Mm, regions of this diagram like I, I see like maybe five clusters or so uh that sort of pop out to me visually how would how would you describe mm -hmm. sort of what the clusters here are mm -hmm. well there's um there's sort of introspective and spiritual ish cluster on the top left um there's the on on the bottom left there's i probably call it like transferring um information or transferring knowledge uh between people so you see education and recommender systems and computer interfaces and personal knowledge management so just sort of it's about the connections it's about the the pipes uh, the, the transfer information between people like at a scale at a scale larger than <clears throat> people oh. um more clusters yeah in the bottom there's like the tech cluster um they all or they a bunch of them connect to like resistance capability which i think is really important because Oh yeah, uh, I, I want to mention, I'll finish the clusters and then I'll mention the thing I want to mention. So uh, in the top, um, in the middle, sort of, there's um, like religious, mythic cluster that's about Dunbar scale coordination. So it's about 
churches and great art and the myths of society, commun community organizing as well. Um, so again, yeah, it's about like connecting people with sort of at this, um, like up here. <laughs> and in the, um, in the far right and top right, uh, it's like far future stuff or like top scale things. So you have X risk and human flourishing in deep time and the fact that we don't even know what, you know, that looks like, what's desirable to, to aim for, you know, what's desirable to maximize. Romeo Stevens has this lighthouse uh, metaphor that I, that I really appreciate which is like, you're not supposed to sail at the lighthouse. So at your utility function, you're supposed to get close enough to the lighthouse that you see the next lighthouse over. So, you know, you keep like bootstrapping your utility function like that. <clears throat> um, yeah, so these are the clusters. I, I, I did want to mention, um, I didn't know about active inference when I, when I made this. Um, and I still don't know a lot <laughs> about active inference, but I, 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 you know, started reading some and watching some lectures, and um, <clears throat> active inference is kind of about this hierarchical um, minimize minimizing of uncertainty, so like maximizing information. Uh, that you know, predictive processing is active inference at the scale of the brain, so it's like. Um, a hierarchical process where you're sort of predicting low level features of your experience uh, that propagate up and the next layer over is predicting slightly coarser features uh, of your experience. So, you know, this is analogous to um, the layers in a, in a convolutional neural, neural network uh, that does vision. So like they, you know, the earlier layers will focus on like a line, uh, like lines. <clears throat> or, or um, yeah, uh, the the next layer uh, will focus on, on like patterns or particular shapes. The you know some layers above will you know notice you know human ears or uh, car wheels, and the top layers will be like, okay, this is you know the, the, this combination of high level features makes a car. This combination of high level features makes a person, um, and. So there's this hierarchical thing uh, going on where you're constantly trying to predict um, what's going to happen and to predict what's going to happen, you need a model. Uh, so you're constantly like building um, a world model and <clears throat> active inference is the sort of the generalized version of predictive pro processing. I might be butchering this because again, I, I haven't read too much I haven't like become an expert or anything, but yeah, active inference sort of generalizes this beyond just the brain, and you can sort of draw um, draw these boundaries that they call Markov blankets around things uh, to think about them as entities. So you know it could apply to a group of people or a company or a, an anthill. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Uh, I see the connections and I'm trying to study it to see if it could inform the way I think about these multi-scale things. Yes. Yeah, let's look at this top right cluster, the human flourishing in deep time. And, um, you know, you said, oh, we can't know what that would look like. And that makes sense to me. But um, what are the qualities that you are looking for or like what what is it that you're trying to steer towards with mm -hmm. um looking at all these connections for the sake of human flourishing in deep time so suffering seems bad um if you if you're optimizing away from suffering you might find yourself looking at wire having, uh, you know, if we, if only we could connect every single human to a, a heroin drip, you know, 
problem all problems would be solved we <laughs> we're done with history mm -hmm. uh but you know of course that seems bad so um qri have said maximizing qualia uh with positive valence um i don't you know i, I keep that in my like pocket but i i'm not comfortable with it because they you know they maintain the qualia have like can have like positive valence negative valence or neutral valence um and um that seems analogous to to vedana i think but why so what i'm not convinced about is like you you could probably just describe valence with a single parameter so it's like it's you know either a lot of suffering or no suffering right so it's like between zero and minus infinity uh, in terms of the quality of experience and so you know minimal suffering would probably be just not existing as a human or like not being so this is a conjecture but like not doing any information processing right like if you're just still if nothing's going on like you have minimal suffering um so you know i guess buddhists think you can get there while still you know while your body is still alive and doing information processing uh and honestly that's what i'm exploring the most nowadays like i'm i finally started meditating every day um like in a like very dedicated way and i've just been getting into buddhism and meditation uh more seriously uh recently mm. probably not probably like largely because of this <laughs> yeah but, it occurs to yeah, me that it, that's one way you could look at this diagram just I, I think you could interpret this a lot of ways and there's there's a lot going on here but like one way i personally tasha and am tempted to mm -hmm. look at this is like how do you um scale um enlightenment basically and societal infrastructures that are supportive of uh enlightened society yeah yeah um yeah definitely <clears throat> i guess <clears throat> um you know ideally if enlightenment isn't the thing that we're looking for um we have like feedback mechanisms that let let us be like oh okay we thought we thought it was enlightenment but actually it's something else uh, or it's enlightenment plus something that can be um foregone mm -hmm. so yeah what i mean is um i wouldn't call this scaling enlightenment i'd probably call this you know following the lighthouses um mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, cursively mm -hmm. but yeah right now i'm exploring that Right, like right now, right now I, I'm seeing like, hmm, okay, maybe maybe it is enlightenment that we just need to scale. Yeah, and there's a lot of really interesting variables that you have in here that um, I, I think on the surface level wouldn't normally be connected with that sort of thing. I mean, a lot of these basically, I mean, however you cut this up, like these are things that you wouldn't normally connect together, and you're connecting them and. Uh, that's I think that's part of why I'm so interested in it is like I of course have been interested in a lot of different things over the years and this is like um, you know I, I haven't known about some of the things on here some of them are new to me but like of the things I'm interested in a lot of them are here and sort of like makes a plausible account of how they'd be connected and so um, yeah I think like from that perspective of a Buddhist or spiritual perspective um, you know th there aren't many Buddhists uh, talking about how that connects to great art or personal knowledge management or, you know, digital democracy or holistic mm -hmm. urbanism or something. Uh, it's like, oh, interesting, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, another question about this top right cluster, because I think that's helpful just to kind of take it in clusters. And um, yeah. 
I want to look at that scale because that, that, that's sort of like the, the the top left one is like where we're starting from one person and yeah. then the top right is sort of where we're aiming to and then everything else is like in between is kind of the sense I'm getting at and yeah that's it. Uh, so he, we talked about human flourishing in deep time and maximizing pol positive quality of diversity you know there's a lot of conversations about x risk and you know, you can hear a lot of things about that. So I, I actually want to sidebar that. That's sort of like obvious. We need to avoid X risks. How to do that, nobody knows, but let's just sidebar that for now. Can you talk okay. to me about the um, parts about the, the the sort of nodes between better science, expanding individual human ability and expanding collective human ability? Like what what's that about and why is that in that cluster? Mm -hmm. So both both better science and expanding individual human ability have asterisks because they're present elsewhere in the graph. Mm -hmm. Better science is um ah yes connected to science that's connected to collective sense making, and expanding individual human ability is connected to personal knowledge management and better computer interfaces. <clears throat> right. So let's see. So. Better science, obviously, um, there's a lot of stuff that we're good at knowing, but there's a lot of stuff that we're bad at knowing because it didn't figure in our evolutionary history um, that prominently. So the way you know things that didn't figure in it is you do experiments with the scientific method um, a lot. and the cool thing about that is that it's a self it's like a bootstrapping process so the more science you do uh, the better you get at doing science um, right now there's a bunch of again I'm no expert like no one could possibly be an expert in, in all of these topics but it's like I've been in academia it doesn't work as well as I hope it would uh, it, I wanted it to be faster and a bit freer and of um perverse incentives like you know publishing a lot or not being a pyramid scheme where there's not enough uh places for all the postdocs um or you know funding not being trapped in the hands of 50 to 60 year old professors with an army of postdocs uh, or or assistant professors um following their research agendas rather than their own um, so, you know, a few people write about science, um, uh, a friend of mine was working on that new science, um, project. He's not anymore. Uh, I was excited about it, but I guess, you know, let's see, but anyway, science could be better. The, there's like decentralized, there's like decentralized, um, science efforts like sort of in the crypto space hopefully not not you know very uh hopefully not very scammy but but like you know i've seen i've seen stuff around um aging uh i've seen i've seen uh, i guess oh yeah i guess there's a, there's a few like really good ml uh research um collectives that are based around Discord and completely open, you know, Eleuther AI, Carper AI. Uh, there's a few other labs that came out of Eleuther. Uh, and those are all really good. Like they, they publish a lot. Like you can go in, uh, you can learn, you can ask people questions uh, on Discord and they'll answer. Uh, you can contribute by showing up and looking at the Google Docs that they have pinned uh, with tasks. And you're like, oh, uh, can I do this task? And they'll be like, sure. Then you commit it and it gets, uh, you make a pull request and it gets reviewed and maybe it gets uh, entered into it then maybe you're made a co-author on the paper like who needs who needs universities who needs uh you know being a surf to professors okay enough about better science <laughs> hmm. 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 what would it look like to expand collective human ability well i guess I guess that's sort of what we're doing at any given point or 
we're doing that probably tangentially. So you can interpret markets. <sighs> markets. Okay. So uh, once again, no expert. Uh, uh -huh. It's it's just the, the, the like intuition sort of yeah. high level knowledge from some reading that I have about things. Anyway, um, you can interpret markets as um you know price discovery mechanisms like resource um distribution um mechanisms that work pretty well because they're decentralized rather than centralized so you don't need like a central processor of information you can just let the processing happen at the edges at the leaves like that seems cool like that seems fine um that seems fine but at the same time, you know, we get all the problems of capitalism uh, that we know, and it's not clear how to solve them, except maybe with machine learning and computers, you can actually get a like communist style economy that still uses markets. I think Paul Cockshot, um, who wrote Towards a New Socialism, sort of looks at that, but I haven't picked up the book yet, but my girlfriend has. Um, Anyway, sorry, C expanding collective human ability. Why am I talking about markets? Because it seems like the market is like the top level arbiter of what happens, <clears throat> right? It's like no one president controls the priorities of the world, except maybe the US, uh, but not really. Um, no one company. So there's like this distributive goal of maximizing um money except i guess on top of on top of that you get you get like the, the world financial institutions yeah, and i don't really know how they work that much but you know i assume the world bank and the imf uh and those guys like that uh have some influence in terms of what happens with um you know at the level of international trade and interest rates and stuff uh, and I guess they are maximizing for power and influence, usually on behalf of the US, uh, if I had to guess, because, you know, the most powerful actor gets the most pull in any given uh, international institution. Um, where am I going with this again? Okay, so if you, if you assume, you know, everything's sort of maximizing for US power, um, at least at least collective human ability of US citizens uh, is or you know the US government is being maximized for but you know it's not the most aggressive um, perversely incentivized optimization so it's not like you know we, we live in a in a hell world where it's the, the US government and nothing else there's a bunch of positive externalities. But Pardon? yeah, you know, when you when you make science better and when you make people uh, better or more powerful by giving them personal knowledge management tools or just better computer interfaces that let them expand what they can uh, and are able to do, or you give them like social technologies that let them coordinate better, uh, etc., you expand collective human ability. Right? Hmm. Yeah, part of how I'm hearing what you're saying is like. Yeah, there's this global coordination bit on the far right, and like we're kind of doing that, but haphazardly. And the best thing we found so far is like markets, which like kind of work, but aren't great and have like downsides. And so, like, is there if all of these things on the left and the middle, like, is there a way that if we uh, really feed these things, that the that we'll be able to do better at the sort of global post-human scale? Or can you repeat the question? I, I think you got cut off for a bit. Oh, yeah. And it's less a question, but more just a reflection that like what I'm hearing is uh, that I'm looking at this like global coordination box on the far right. And like uh, we're kind of doing that through markets right now yeah. with some success and some failure. And sort of like there's a hypothesis here in the diagram that if we 
get better at the things in the left and the middle that we would be better able to do global coordination yeah. and that would lead to the human flourishing yeah. in deep time. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. that's exactly the implication. Yes, great. Um, so yeah, let's let's move to the left then. Um, talk to me about the top left cluster that has mm -hmm. to do with individuals, spiritual work, introspection, things like that. Like, um, why why would that be the seed of the rest of this? What what is it that you're noticing as you look at? spiritual traditions and Buddhism and, you know, these different introspective practices mm -hmm. that seems connected to these other things. Okay. Let's see. I mean, to, to put that question slightly differently, like a lot of people would start looking at human flourishing in deep time from a perspective of like politics or money or yeah, t say technology, or um, I think even the notes management one is like already a little bit um, novel, but like why start with introspection and spiritual practice and, you know, ending dukkha and things like this. Yeah. So before, no, not before anything. Okay. Why start with this? Cause uh, like I said, the information processing thing, uh, where you know all the information that we get sort of bubbles up from experience uh, and gets processed and filtered uh, through a few layers in ourselves before it leaves us, and it starts you know the information starts colliding with um, the information that other people have, and that needs to be aggregated. Um, and you know, there's a clear bottleneck between you know the information that you have access to and that you can in integrate and transform and then the the very slight you know there's a bottleneck between that and what you can express outward um so processing becomes a lot more sparse because you, you only get access to language and you know acting in the world um, and, and the reason the reason this is really important for the human flourishing in deep time and etc is that <clears throat> Sort of. So if you're doing all these things, if you're, you know, uh, if if you have some like spiritual practice, if you're doing yoga or if you're, you know, meditating or doing focusing or parts work to get rid of your trauma, you, you're sort of eliminating distortions in the stack, right? It's like you have problems because you're not doing the thing that's best for you, or, or, or the, you know, you're not. Um, your suffering isn't de decreasing continually or, or you're not acting in the world in such a way that will make your suffering be less and, and let you flourish more. Um, so all these practices I see as sort of removing layers, removing distortion that got accreted onto us by life experiences, not being able to process certain things like as babies often aren't uh, or, you know, toddlers or pre-teens or teens, uh, we just get thrown life experiences, we handle them in, in the sort of crappy ways that we're able to, and then that leads to some distortions, and my hypothesis sort of is, you know, you can go back, um, reprocess all that stuff, and get like uh, layers that look more like glass and let, let clear signal through rather than being sort of um <clears throat> so those iced glass windows uh <laughs> i forget the the term i was going for a pretty metaphor here but you know stuff that will distort and diffuse the light and sort of point it in different directions so that that it's hard to interpret anyway um information's bubbling up you're removing the distortions uh and the reason it's important for information to flow is that if you're looking at things um, correctly uh, and you'll be acting on your behalf in terms of like, am I gonna minimize my own suffering and the, the suffering of those around me? If you're gonna be acting like that in the world, uh, then we move on to the collective sense-making bit where people's wishes and people's worldviews are being aggregated and, and sort of, 
competing and being made compatible, etc. And when you aggregate people's opinions, you have a chance to um, to coordinate action, right? You have a chance to coordinate action. And sometimes that's easy and sometimes that's hard. And when it's hard, it's usually because of uh, social dilemmas or public goods problems, where the game theory is just not in your favor, uh, in the favor of um, actors who, who are coordinating without like a top-down uh, structure. So the need for stuff like government, like part of the need for stuff like government um, or overstructure is to sort of solve public dilemmas, uh, um, social dilemmas, public goods uh, problems, where it's like, okay, the, the the natural incentives are bad, so they'll lead you to the fact when you'd be better off cooperating. So, you know, I'm imposing the structure that changes the incentives for you, so you get to cooperate right now. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, this is great if this didn't mean that the top level uh, enforcer was also an agent um that can then pursue its own goals um and when it's pursuing its own goals if you interpret this top level government agent as you know you would a person um it's ignoring some of its parts right when, when it's acting to the detriment of its constituents it's ignoring some of its parts uh, and if it ignores parts for long enough um something's gonna break right and but you can ignore your parts down to the you know down to the bitter end where you know people just revolt or the state collapses because it failed or you know if resistance capability in the bottom right uh is high enough if if people are able to coordinate without top down without top down structure um at each of the layers below then feedback can flow up right it's not just top down being imposed uh it's like the, the feedback can flow up outside of the, the rules that the top down impose because it's it's like resistance once again, and you know the top down can be held accountable or weak, right? And <clears throat> if you get this feedback loop uh, where you're able to like tweak the top the the top level core, sorry the the coordinator uh, at each layer up to the top level, um, you know you reach whoever's in charge of global coordination uh if anyone or if it's the market you're able to like tweak some parameters of the market like interest rates or whatever and hopefully you get a better world than if you weren't able to tweak those things right hmm. so if the information hadn't been able to flow up the sense i got when you're talking about that is like individual people are like parts of a greater whole where they're like neurons of a brain or like cells in a body or uh you know parts of a computer chip or something like that and like either the individual cells are like well aligned to be able to work with other cells or they're like not and then you know it's not binary of course there's like some between like zero and 100 effectiveness or something like that and that from that perspective like these all of these practices and you know spiritual traditions and different psychotechnologies are like ways to create people who are like more well aligned with other people and able to work towards a greater whole than like rather than just like introducing friction in the system uh is that is that sort of how you see it yeah yeah definitely i would add that people are neurons in the brain but they're also people right and each of the entities uh at each of the scales is a neuron in a brain and also its entity uh, yes. that is, you know, also a brain, right? Because, you know, we're brains, <laughs> we have neurons. Part, part of what I'm hearing in that, and I'm, I might be over-interpreting, but just seems helpful to sort of reflect what I'm hearing from you, because yeah. um, there's so much here, uh, is the part of what I'm hearing is, okay, they're each of these scales from self to post-human and the smaller scales are part of the bigger scales, but they also have like intrinsic value and are worthy of, I know I would say like worthy of love and respect on their own level as well. Uh, is that, is that kind of part of what you're saying? Yeah, that's part of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, there was a time where we didn't have cities, right? Mm -hmm. There was a time where we didn't have 
world government or mm-hmm. something approaching that. And there's going to be a time where we have different planets mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, world government isn't the top level thing. So it's like, it's humanity is sort of following the, the the lighthouse thing. So figuring out what it wants to do, figuring out what it values, figuring out where to draw the boundaries of coordination. And yeah, uh, if you if we didn't value um, squads as if okay, so here's the thing: <clears throat> I'm not sure I believe that we sh- we should value these things in- intrinsically, or or that it ontologically makes sense to value them intrinsically. But it it makes sense to act as if you do. Hmm. And it and like. Or, or even to you know, because or even to be as if you do. So like to to actually believe that even if you know uh, an all-seeing observer was like, okay, if we have to sacrifice these one hundred churches for the benefit of the you know whole collective for the benefit of the globe, let's just do it, right? It's like, yeah, I guess I guess what I'm pointing at is you still need to do sort of utilitarian math. Um, what makes you hesitant to prescribe value to the nodes? And you're saying it's like worth acting as if they have value or like worthy of respect, but like it, you seemed hesitant to say that they definitely are. What, what What's that about? So, okay, so when I feel into it, I... I do feel respect for the things uh, at, at each scale, right? I, I, I do get meta uh, when I when I think about each of uh, entities at each of these levels and and appreciate their beauty and you know their glory of what they're achieving. Um, I guess. Okay, so, so I I I'd, I'd be comfortable with saying like that I ascribe like intrinsic value to something like complexity that has a low distortion quotient in the information that it's propagating up or something like that. So. <clears throat> Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm confused about what value is. But I definitely, you know, again, I, I feel meta uh, and appreciation for things at each scale. And I think if everyone did, things would be maximally Okay, not maximally good, but would be really good, like like insanely good. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm one thing I'm noticing about that, and can I... well, a few things. One is to me, I think it's axiomatic that for, for me, it's axiomatic that like all beings are worthy of love and respect, and from in in the perspective in the context of this conversation, I'm like. Well, it seems obvious to me that like n- not only is that a value that I hold personally, but like if you're going to coordinate people at multiple scales, that like you would need to have that kind of an orientation to have people uh, um, coordinate effectively because it can't just be like, oh, let's do things for Francisco or Tashin or this other person, like for their benefit, it has to be for the benefit of all. And um, And then the thing that I'm noticing with that is like, oh, you know, I think people are really good at um, meta for self and meta for the people that they know. And then people, but not really, not necessarily really good, but like it's it's known that you should practice meta for yourself, that you should practice meta for other individuals in your life. And then like for all beings. And then like there's not much talk about meta for the scales in between. I'm like, huh, interesting. Yeah. We should solve that. Meta for hyperorganism. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, anything more you want to say about any of that before I move on to a different cluster? <clears throat> I 
Yeah, I, I just want to flag that. Um, I think it's a really, really good. So you you said it's axiomatic, like the the like appreciation and respect for for each being, but I, I guess the confusion for me stems from. So, sorry, I think. I think it's a practically good axiom to have and that it gives good results. But I I wonder what, you know, because what's a being, right? Like all of these things at, at each of these scales, including humans, I mean, maybe humans are special. Uh, that's part of the, the, the uncertainty. Uh, but all of these things are like tangles of, you know, information being processed and transformed. And it's like, what makes what makes a being at a given scale be a being rather than not a being, just a collection of different beings at the scale below. And you know there's stuff you can say, like the Markov blankets thing that, that I mentioned earlier, um, about like the density of information that flows flows in and out and how much how much information is so the density, uh, the density of information based on locality. Um, sorry. Anyway, I'm questioning like the the notion of being, and then the quest, and then the notion of value, because it's like okay. The, then this brings us to AI, but I, I don't really want to talk about AI. But it's like you know, does an AI that acts as if it's that that acts as if it feels meta for every single being at every single scale and that just does like a, an insane amount of good like why shouldn't that ai be considered a being and, and respected and loved and um have its interests defended for example um but so you know th that's a bunch of questions i'm still not sure around and that i should probably like stick on a on a post-it <laughs> note and on my wall. I don't think I'd be very good at philosophically justifying the views that I have for this sort of thing, but it seems to me over here that uh, not only should individual humans be worthy of love and respect and kindness, uh, but also groups of humans and non-humans, including plants and animals and the planet, and also uh, AI. Yeah, if 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 you know, we create age agentic sentient computers, um, it would seem that they would be worthy of love and respect as well. And um, I don't know, also, you know, if we've encountered aliens or I think beings in other realms, you know, if if yeah. if they exist there, it, it, the same orientation would apply at least. I mean, that's how I would want to orient towards it. Yeah, me too, right? I, I, I'm saying these things out of... um like radical uncertainty mm -hmm. type thing, you know, mm -hmm. questioning everything. Yes. But beings in other realms where realms are sort of just different frequencies or, or modes of thought, right? Like stuff in the noosphere, right? Like memes and meme plexes and egregores. Like those are entities. Uh, you can draw Markov blankets around these things. Um, so yeah i just wanted to flag that that this is a thing that i find really interesting and i've done i'd love to do like technical research on it mm. but i haven't i just think about it but sorry i know you talked about this earlier but can you say again uh what markov blankets are yeah uh, let me bring them up but, 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 but it's um Actually, it's like you can draw a boundary around. Um, let's see. Okay, it's um. You, in probability, you have these things called graphical models, which are like just graphs of, of um, random variables. Uh, so you know, imagine like a, a network of like little circles that can represent events. 
uh, it could represent like you know the probability that a cell in the game of life is alive or not for example right and uh, the Markov blanket would be um, a membrane of random variables to be precise like two layers of membranes uh, of random variables that sort of isolate the the nodes on the inside of the of the graph from the nodes on the outside of the graph so uh, if you did the math the, um, the random variables on the inside would be considered independent from the ones on the outside um, whereas you know any two variables on the inside would be you know somewhat dependent uh, you, you'd find some overlap in the venn diagrams uh, of their states um, and the same for the outside <clears throat> it's, it's just a you know an informa information theoretic way to think about boundaries uh, but again i want to develop this more i, I don't <laughs> feel like i'm like fucking like a person who's well versed in hmm. in active inference well i think um it's and just this is a tangent but at least from my perspective um i mean i really think there aren't experts in the world about the things that are most important right now like they're experts about very specific things or even one or two specific things but like to kind of be able to zoom out and look at the gestalt of life on this planet right now like you can't be an expert on like everything and uh because the systems are so incredibly complex and um i think that you need a mind like the one that you have that you're demonstrating in this conversation and to you know the mind that made this um diagram to sort of be take the courageous step of like being willing to like synthesize patterns that you're recognizing without expertise just being like hey i know enough about this to like say there's a pattern here and this seems connected to this other thing and like experts would get really um zoomed in on a specific thing which is good that's important too because you know you need someone to like i don't know figure out how to do deeper physics or like how to do a different safe mdma or something like that but like um i think it's a really unique role to kind of um, almost like glaze your eyes a little bit and be like, so what's what's happening here? You know, like at that at that scale, yeah. like what what is even being alive on this planet right now? And like, how do all these trends fit together and and not get bogged down into like just any one of these things? Um, so I, I really value this conversation from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I wonder. Yeah, another question about this cluster is coming up for me, which is um, almost like, how do you, from your perspective, see and understand what spiritual traditions are? Okay. <clears throat> so I, I was thinking about this recently, actually. Um, the usual way I talk about spiritual traditions is I imagine them as a set of psychotechnologies like sort of introspective technologies and social technologies so um technologies that let you so recipes and tricks that let you coordinate with other people hmm. um excuse me and um recently i was thinking about like, about like you probably need a story um or a narrative to sort of connect these things together um it, it's not enough that it's a you know a set of these two toolkits um but yeah uh, like that's like the minimal that's like the minimal definition um of a of a spiritual tradition for me so you know they You know, they form on some set of axioms or some um, initial insights or bag of insights, and they, you know, are accreted upon and they branch when there's two different interpretations of what a thing means or like of what technology should be used when or, you know. Yeah, like the, the meaning thing, I was thinking about ontological differences, but I think I covered it covered that hmm. Hmm. 
That's helpful. Um, so let's move on to that cluster in the bottom left. Uh, talk to me about what bottom-up sense-making means. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> bottom-up in the sense that it flows from your phenomenology up right it's um yeah <laughs> so we, we've been we've been talking about it right so that the, there's uh these layers within you that may have distortions and you're sort of trying to minimize distortions and it goes up through the senses the um you know patterns that you're trained to recognize or that you evolve to recognize up to your own meaning making systems that were either taught to you or that you develop on your own um, <clears throat> and the the bottom left cl cluster sort of relates to that because it's sort of about it's sort of about the top layer of the individual uh, scale uh, so <clears throat> transmitting and receiving knowledge from others, right? Uh, so thinking about pedagogy, uh, schools, uh, teaching frameworks, um, like art and consuming art and, and, you know, what we call content now, but, you know, consuming stories that serve as uh, um, models but but not explicit models implicit yeah yeah consuming like art that serves as implicit models for what may be happening in reality right in, in experience um that that's the sort of intuitive bit um i guess recommender systems yeah yeah the, the art segues into content which which brings up recommender systems so it's like <clears throat> you know we have feeds <laughs> of content now we have feeds of essentially stories or or little like memes um and the way the information is selected for you to consume is really important right like there's there's no way around it since since all information that starts being propagated upwards comes from phenomenology and your phenomenology nowadays consists of like what 50 percent of the time looking at a screen uh you know uh that's an obvious lever to 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 mess with hmm. so you don't want recommender systems that are maximizing for platform um like user time spent on platform or like ad revenue uh, you want really personalized recommender systems that you know are showing you um st the stuff you need the stuff that you know would be the most therapeutic or soothing or mind expanding uh, as possible, or that would just tell you to go outside. You know, the recommender system, like the feed should be like, yo, uh, it's done. You know, you asked me to stop you if you spent more than an hour or two uh, on the feed and you have, so go outside, go do something else. You told me, like this is the, the feed talking to you. You told me that you wanted to be really good at guitar, but you never have the motivation. Just go do that, right? Like, you told me you don't spend enough time with your family, so go spend some time with your family. A and that's the end of that, right? Like, why should you spend 50% of your time looking at a screen? Hmm. Yeah, after that, um, there's personal knowledge management and, and better computer interfaces, uh, which, you know, <clears throat> computer interfaces, Worry Dream, Brett Victor, um, has, like, great ideas about this. Uh, the argument he makes is like, you know, we have so many sort of, you know, we have many sense doors, right? Uh, and but to interact with with screens and, and the internet, we use what our eyes, our ears sometimes if we're listening to music or to people talking. Uh, but it's like we have three or four or five, depending on how you count, more senses to take in information. But beyond that, to input. We use our we use our fingertips, and that's it. And we have like whole bodies capable of way more nuanced motions than than just 
pressing but like triggering digital buttons uh, you know if you could influence parameters of computations with with your body movement um you'd be able to, to input a lot more information at a time right and i think we're going to get that with with like big transformers uh, that are multimodal I, th I think we're walking we're on, on our way to something like that uh, and finally the the type of thinking especially if you're a programmer uh is is like linear right like it's, it's like that um logical propositional way of thinking like that system two uh versus system one which is a lot uh, a lot more intuitive and processes a lot more information again um that's it's just limiting right it's it's it feels like we we experience the world and we interact with the world through computers but it's like a tiny little bottleneck through which you need to like be sending be sending your stuff and like receiving your stuff oh that's really nice right it's like what if what if you could use your whole body and, and some stuff like so that that just seems like a huge bottleneck too hmm. um yeah and the personal knowledge management is like if i forget my insights if i forget my if i forget to take notes or if i can't find my notes later uh it's just less efficient but at the same time i think most people who are into knowledge management feel this it's like you spend a lot of time crafting a crafting a system that seems good and then you don't use it or, or you forget to use it or your most productive uh time is actually when you're not using it and the insights just come to you in the shower after they've been processing in the background for a while so you know hmm. i'm still unsure about personal knowledge management mostly but i still love it something i'm sort of uh receiving from hearing you talk about this is like something like okay we had that cluster that was just about an individual human and then almost they do this uh act of service where they digest what they've processed into something that's legible to other people and like i was thinking about like as an example like my website on the internet like that's obviously like that's not who i am but it's like kind of the digested uh almost like proof of work that i as as a person have done that's like okay like here's how you can interface with me world like this is the thoughts and things that I've done and like you can contact me here and like read this or go watch this or but like that's not who I am but it's sort of like a public uh interface for Perfect. interacting with me and that that would be um um what is it? it's like almost like yeah that's a service for the whole and also something you need as an individual to um be able to participate in the network in a like high bandwidth way yeah yeah in, a, in like a little higher bandwidth mm -hmm. way too right like incomparable to, to what could be achieved by just meeting you for five minutes mm -hmm. yes that's right that's right uh yeah and that's why we're having this conversation because as amazing as this diagram is it's like it it, it behooves us to talk about it verbally because there's a lot uh a lot here to kind of be like well i know yeah like what is that exactly so uh, how does that connect to that? So, um, hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I want to ask about great art. Um, what's the question? It's like, I guess I could see how great art would fit into the parts that are connected to collective sense-making and community organizing and like driving myth and narrative. Like that makes sense to me. The question is something like, why would great art be valuable from your perspective on the individual scale? Um, you know, I, I could answer that within my perspective, but from the, this frame, how, how would you, how do you make sense of that? Yeah. So the, the trivial answer is like, uh, art as psychotechnology, mm. right? art as, um, <clears throat> You know a little packet packet of information like someone sends you a function uh look you know uh a little function that changes state a into state b and it's just you know uh and ties a knot right or or gives you a little lens to look at things that you know make the painful be uh 
exciting or less painful. Uh, the, um, wait, is this satisfying? Um, kind of. I, I could ask more about it, but feel free to add more if there's more you want to say. Yeah, um, I should mention I have this bad, bad theory um, about what art and philosophy and, and science are or are doing. And, and I tweeted this recently, and it's like philosophy is pre no art is pre paradigmatic philosophy, and philosophy is pre paradigmatic science. Um, and what art's doing is propagating information from you know i said verveckian relevance realization but you can talk about this as um yeah you can say like experience right but relevance realization points at what's happening in experience which is you're experiencing the thing that seems most relevant and and the um, sort of underlayer of experience the thing that's bubbling up stuff to be experienced is some process that's taking in all the information and being like, this is relevant, this is not relevant, this is relevant, and this is not relevant. And sort of what art's doing is, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's like it's picking up patterns uh, in, in in chaos, like not 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 true chaos because there's this relevant serialization mechanism going on, but like art speak. Art is the artist picking up patterns from its relevance realization landscape and packaging them up into stuff that is surprising uh, for others uh, or society or himself, right? Like if you need to make something and then look at it and experiencing it to like unlock something within you or like I made this and it's surprising to me and it's changing the way I look at things. Um, yeah, art's about surprise. Um, and surprise is sort of the inverse quantity of uh, information. So this ties into the, the whole uh, active inference information, multi-scale information processing framework. So, you know, philosophy would be uh, turning the patterns into a system, right? You have a bunch of lines uh, and you just connect the lines into like this graph or um, knowledge map. And then science is designing experiments uh, that may refute or confirm the the philosophical system. Hmm. There's a kind of just all time getting from that of like, and part of where this is coming from is, you know, I've been making visual art for a couple of years now and I'm I like on a soul level, I trust that a lot. I'm like, I just need to make art, you know? Uh, and yeah. then it's been, like an open question for me intellectually, like what's happening here and why do I care about this and how does this fit into the rest of my life? And um, it's been, you know, really enjoyable and, and fruitful, but I'm, I'm realizing um, this puts me a different perspective for at least for my intellectual mind uh, about what it is that I'm doing, which is like, yeah, similar to what we talked about before, but like digesting almost the the gestalt of what it means to be me um into some visual artifact that other people can look at and be like impacted by and be like oh wow i didn't know you could see the world that way or feel that way about this thing um and like the better i get at art making visual art or of course like writing which i care a lot about or other things um the more i'm able to uh communicate that to people yeah, yeah. So you're always working, mm -hmm. and the you know the better you're able to to communicate it, the more service you you're able to provide. Mm -hmm. Well, I like that a lot. I mean, I, I, as I say, um, it was already sort of intrinsically meaningful and satisfying to me to make art anyway. But I I like having a new lens on what's happening there. Uh, yeah, let's talk about. Um, the parts that start to get into the bigger scales beyond like say one-to-one -one and um you know squad what what um i think the thing i'm most interested in here is collective sense sense making and in particular um the bit about twitter and teapot 
and decentralized Twitter and mm, how to put it like you and I have both in, been involved in this community, you know, how, whatever word you want to use for it. Yeah, I agree. It's not, it's not, it's not the same as like, um, I don't know, uh, participating in a, in a like club or something like that, where you're like, are in or you're out or something like that. It's, it's a little bit more nebulous and boundary and there's like neighborhoods and stuff like that. But for lack of a better vocabulary about it, um, you know, you and I have, have both been in this neck of the woods. Um, and I, you know, I, I've thought for quite some time that there's something very significant happening there, and I have my own perspectives about what's happening there, but I'm curious how, again, from this perspective of this diagram and how you see things, how you would describe what you see happening on Twitter and Teapot and these sort of uh, networks. Man, yeah. It's just a topic that excites me. Like, I think this this might be, this might be like, um... You know, very biased, of course, but but I think teapot's probably one of the most important things happening in the world, uh, which feels insane to say. Uh, and you know, I'm sure there's other teapots that, like, I'm sure there's other groups of people with you know interests that are as eclectic, uh, people that are as bright and as kind. Uh, I've met some people, like I, I've met groups of people that are like this and that, that aren't on Twitter or that aren't that on Twitter that much. So, you know, I know that's true, but Teapot's big. Teapot's huge. And again, the, the word Teapot, whatever, it's just what's coming out of my mouth right now, even though I don't love the name, whatever. Um, so why is it important? And, and why? how does it fit into to the diagram and the, the collective sense-making bit? Um, I think there's a few reasons. So there's first there's all these these people uh, that you know are going about their lives. They've had the experiences that they have, and they have their own interests. And a lot of their interests figure in this in this graph. And like I mentioned, you know we're all we're all fondling the elephant <laughs> from different uh, perspectives. But you know at least for me, like. My experience not being on Teapot and then being on Teapot was like, oh, there's really cool people <laughs> that I've never met and that I can't hang out with unless I'm on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and then I start meeting them in real life because, you know, we share context and they're really cool and we, we um, get along great and we have very compatible aims for life so that just feels great and you know if i travel to some place there's gonna be a mutual there uh that's gonna host me or like at least get a coffee uh, with me and chat and it just feels um you know to me it feels like the coolest people in different places you know i just get access to um but why is this happening? Like, why did this happen? Uh, I think Twitter is really conducive to it. Uh, th there's something, there's something about Twitter, uh, the way the the recommender system works that makes um makes bubbles feel cozy, but it, but they're also permeable. So it's like you get to have your your own neighborhood where you see each other's tweets, um, you know, recur in a recurring way. Uh, but, you know, new people can show up uh, and people on other parts of Twitter can find it, can, you know, maybe one of your tweets was really popular and suddenly a bunch of, a, a bunch of new people started following you and started following your friends and etc. Um, so the, the fact that it's permeable uh, is a big thing. I also like that, you know, you can be silly on Twitter, but you can also be ambitious and, and, and have pretty good discussions on, on, on Twitter. Uh, I think tweets work really well as atoms of knowledge you know they're short but you can express an idea right like if you're if you're concise enough you can express a pretty complex idea in 300 characters and um you can chain them together with thread uh, and, and <clears throat> that goes um in the direction of like zettelkasten like the card based uh note-taking thing uh 
yeah so you people including myself have made like threads of threads right like you get this graph that references different parts of itself uh at different points so you can sort of build up a database of takes or insights or knowledge or whatever you like uh, so again it works sort of as a as a collective knowledge management layer on top of the entire world while letting you be silly with your friends at the same time and, and both things can coexist uh, which i don't know i, I haven't experienced before <clears throat> anyway this means that the the smart ambitious people uh, that like to be serious can also be silly with one another and become friends and and then you know turns out these pe people have like really cool nice values or, or like some of them do and uh really interesting ideas or really fresh takes on stuff that's going on and then people start paying attention and you know next thing you know you have like four different billionaires following eigenrobot or you know more than that honestly uh and i don't know it feels like it feels like a cool sort of movement of the flow right like the DAO's moving in interesting directions hmm. through unsuspecting channels hmm. I'm tempted to sort of interpret what teapot is from the perspective of this diagram as like, if you take a bunch of people who are like reasonably well aligned within themselves, who have like, who, who want to align with each other and have, yeah, from that sort of second bottom left cluster, like made their own insights and values discoverable to other people and like put them in a room that like teapot is almost like an emergent pattern of coordination that seems to like scale. That's, that's even better than what I said. Hmm. That like, I love that. Hmm. Hmm. You, well, you said something I do want to pull up uh, uh, a year ago. You said, um, if you're wondering what Vibe Camp was, it was oh. an egregore coming online, the local organizational principle of which is not just love, but boundless curiosity and play. We finally have a mecha suit to fight Moloch. Uh, again, uh, talk to me about that. What is what is what is the egregore and what is the mecha suit? Yeah. Well, Why did I say the egregore is coming on? Okay, first, what's an egregore? Right. It's sort of a, it's like an informational entity, right? That's running on many brains. It's like a, a program running on a computer cluster, right? It's running in parallel, like different parts of the program are running in different heads. But if you look at it from above, you can see the information being processed and actions being taken. Um, or, you know, something that looks like a self-organizing process. You don't need to think of it in terms of an agent necessarily. Anyway, um, why did I say it came online then? Because people had only been interacting online, very narrow bandwidth, and suddenly 400 people meet in person, right? And and you know, you go from this much bandwidth to this much bandwidth. Holy shit! Right, like the, the, the Markov blanket, the Markov blanket, like just covered uh, everyone that was there. And it's like it, it didn't. It's not like it remained that coherent of an egregore because people went uh, about their lives. But you know, a bunch of groups formed. A bunch of people started hanging out regularly. Who? who you know people who live in the same city usually um and we just took a snapshot we took a snapshot of the collective will right like there was a vibe everybody felt the vibe uh or some version of the vibe or their interpretation of the vibe and and that's like a coordination point right like that's a that's like a a shelling thing a, sh a shelling point where you can say you know unconsciously you can look back at how things were and you can extrapolate how things are going to be because you were there and you felt it. Um, 
Um, the mecha suit is sort of the same thing, right? It's like you're part of the self-organizing principle. Um, if you're lucky, uh, you have a sense of the levers you can pull. Um, you know, like of, you, you can point information this way instead of that way. You can you can start working on this because you identify the need in the in the network that if it were satisfy like a lot more information would flow or like more, much more clearly or a bunch of suffering would be eliminated. Um, so yeah, the, the mecha suit just means it, it, it's it's kind of a coordination mechanism and you can sort of use it to a degree or, or be of use to it and, and impact its decisions. <clears throat> And to fight Moloch, because what Moloch's like the god of coordination failure, uh, right? So uh, there's public goods problems that we can solve, social dilemmas that we can solve, uh, and those are because of Moloch. And if we have this sort of coordination mechanism that at the moment is quite loose, um, but you know, quite full of goodwill, uh, we can fight it. We can start solving some coordination problem. Remember, remember when uh, a couple of cool people who, you know, I just probably won't say their handles, but a couple of cool people had a pretty tragic accident uh, last year, like last summer, like twenty five thousand dollars just materialized in what two or three days to to you know sort of help them land on their feet a bit more, you know. That's insane, you know, and that's a coordination problem everybody wishes they could solve. If there was like a community fund, so you, you felt a bit less, um, you know, at risk or, or in danger or to sort of, you know, like who doesn't want something like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of a proof that things can be done, right? Like uh, conditions can be improved, circumstances mm -hmm. can be improved. Hmm. What are the properties that you notice of the egregore or the mecha suit? Like, how would you describe teapot um, in its in its uh, properties? Like, what makes that coordination possible? Hmm. So, I'm not saying teapot's perfect, right? Uh, teapot suffers from a bunch of things other scenes uh, suffer from, but people are really critical, like in a good way. Uh, people have good epistemics generally, or like the group has better epistemics than average than, uh, yeah, has better epistemics than average or the, than most other groups. Um, so, you know, there's less distortion in terms of like beliefs, right? People, people will have nuanced um yeah nuanced beliefs about the world or um they'll they'll be wiser uh mm, what else a lot of people are pretty competent in, in in this like in terms of like being technically um competent and just being pretty agentic right in terms of they're they're less entangled with they're they're less a critically entangled with their environment so what what that means is you know I, i'm distinguishing between more agentic people and people who would you know follow a life script because it's it's the, the ambient thing uh to do right like I, i'm gonna live like my parents did or like my parents want me to or like the people around me are living right um someone would be critically entangled with their environment would be someone who you know cares for their family and friends because that's the right thing to do and you know maybe maintains uh, a permaculture farm or, or is just involved in civic life uh out of you know wanting to do it and having thought or felt into it uh rather than out of obligation or just because it's the thing to do right or being less caught up in culture wars would be the internet version of that. 
so yeah like more critical uh reasoning and so i usually use the words bright and kind uh, and the kind bits uh you know you mentioned people who have you know worked the top left corner uh enough that there's you know less distortions you can look at it like that right like the conclusions that you come to when you're sort of you know well enough or, or when your suffering has decreased to uh, a certain point is that you know you now have capacity to expand outwards and help others and that would make you more kind for example yeah i do think this is uh i had this tweet recently about a uh, guy who touches the elephant and shouts love is the answer you know uh and that's 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 me but um like to me kindness seems like a really important um quality in the community of just generally speaking i see people trying to be kind to each other not be mean to each other uh not make things worse like not engage in just like frivolous argumentation it's it's still hard people aren't perfect and like people also have different values about how they do that and what that looks like for them but like i think that's that's a reasonably well distributed like shared value of like we will be kind to each other and not be mean um and i think that's something that's made me inclined to participate is just like yeah i don't i know i think a lot of people don't like um you know the sort of like just argumentation as default for coordination at that scale mm -hmm. of like you're wrong i'm right uh kind of like the, that's the um the previous version of how to coordinate on the internet is just like i will tell you what i think and not listen to what you think you know uh yeah. and you're bad if you see it differently than i do and that's it um seems like more nuanced than that of just like yeah everybody they might see it differently and i might disagree but it doesn't mean they're an asshole or something or that i need to be a jerk to them yeah um yeah and if you think about it it's it's just the more efficient way to behave right it's like if you're the so surely the other person has done work right surely the other person has processed information uh and they feel strongly about something. And you know, they may feel strongly about, about something because they have a bunch of distortions and they're misapprehending the situation, but they could also not, right? And there's no situation where you just be aggro, right? Like you you either talk to them uh, long enough to realize that, you know, they're either they either don't have anything to offer and they're just mad or they actually have something to offer and you and then you try to synthesize both both of your you know sort of information payloads you know you do the pieces antithesis synthesis thing uh or you just walk away if, if they don't have anything to offer there's there's no reason to to like try to convince someone that they're wrong by saying you're wrong like that's that's just not go, gonna work right like everyone's trying their best mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes can you talk about the two nodes that are, well, the three nodes that are reinterpreting spiritual traditions, comparative computational theology, and then new religion and new church? Uh, uh, what what do you imagine those looking like? Where's, where's, oh, I, I see it. Yeah. What do I imagine those looking like? Yeah. So that's one of the projects I wouldn't mind actually spending time working on and i'd be happy uh every single moment um yeah so the the dunbar scale coordination thing is is, is just very absent like uh, uh, in the whole landscape probably the the um, the scale that's most like degraded and less present is the dunbar scale level like people will have friend groups and families and then people will be like working at some massive corporation and they'll vote on national elections, right? It's like very few people know their neighbors. Even fewer people hang out with their neighbors regularly. Like there's there's just none of that because people stop going to church because, you know, obviously God doesn't exist. You know, how could the, an old bearded man uh, be in the sky? So therefore I'm gonna, I'm just gonna leave all my cultural heritage behind. Uh, and the systems that made society function. In all fairness, you know, the church as an institution is different from the, the set of practices and social and psychotechnologies, but 
and people were pretty disillusioned with the, the institution but anyway there's a, a niche to be filled like there's that needs to be brought online squads of people need to mingle people need to hang out at Lenbarska. so um new church right you need something that feels that that fills that niche uh it doesn't need to look like a church with benches and an altar um but it needs to be something where about 150 people hang out semi-regularly and sync their models like sync their vibes you go and ask people how they are like can you help them in any way like you'll share some stories you'll um bring up issues like the community has things to talk about hmm. uh okay so you need a place for that and you need sort of a, a recurring thing for that uh how do you decide what that looks like how do you assemble it you need a new religion uh, hmm. and you it doesn't need to be like a religion with a prophet and a set of teachings and like a few axioms that you need to believe or else um again it needs to be a tool set of social and psycho technologies like it says on the uh, on the note and probably <laughs> and probably uh a story or a, an argument a narrative something like that um to sort of collate it together and motivate it and provide like a shelling point for people to to organize around um one thing that I, i'm unsure whether is needed or not is um sort of like useful lies <laughs> or or better said it's like a topic that i've been wrestling with because it's like if you look back at like great theologians and stuff again i'm not an expert in theology uh but you know i've read a bit uh these people are insanely smart like saint augustine like holy shit like uh meister eckhart like these people have understanding uh these people have wisdom they're not they're not blindly believing a uh, set of stories and a set of commandments, right? So they 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 intrinsically get the game theory behind Christianity and behind why you you know coordinate in the ways that you do. Uh, it's because you need to solve an iterated prisoner's dilemma, and cooperating is the the best uh, way to do that. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> So the useful lie is that, you know, these people get it, like a select number of people really get it and are really motivated by it because it just makes intrinsic sense. And then there's another set of people, the majority that probably, you know, are just asked to believe because they don't have time or the capacity to, you know, get the intricacies uh, of the argument for why these things work. Are you still with me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I, I wonder if there have always been like two sets of stories or, or like two, two sets of, of knowledge strands, like one that's like in touch with reality and one that's just, you know, an arbitrary shelling point that you give people so that they'll behave in the way that's better for everyone mm -hmm. or that you want them to be. Yeah, I think that's a recurring pattern for sure. Um two things are popping out to me here one is just to me i think this was implicit in what you're saying but like you're like oh we need pete you said people need to be coordinating at the dunbar scale and um to me in the context of this it's like we're not going to be able to coordinate at the global and post-human levels or you know i would probably add like interstellar levels if uh we don't have the, the good good coordination at sort of the mid-range and so um yeah, and the other thing that pops out is like, I guess I don't I don't really like the word cult. Um, I have a thread about this, but like um I, I think it's I, I won't I I think this is similar to how you feel about teapot of like, oh I don't it's not quite the right word, community's not quite the right word, cult is not quite the right word, but but the behaviors that people are um pointing to with the word cult are like real and not um not good you know it's, it, there's there's a reason that 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 word has sort of reified in, in the way that it has and um i guess it makes a lot of sense to me that if you tried to start a new church at the sort of congregation scale without or the squad or congregation scale without 
a new religion that's from the context of reinterpretive spiritual traditions that like that would sort of be danger zone where like you would have I don't know. It's it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem of like I don't know. I I think that's what's coming to me is like cults are trying to solve this problem, but it's like not in the context of like a broader environment and like um, they probably I think I think generally, and this is very speculative, but like generally probably cults have some the like quote cults have some positive thing that they're trying to do that like helps the people that are in it and it's like yeah they're like they have some wisdom that the system needs and then it's like isolated from. A large the larger society and like interface with it and then it just sort of like goes off and has problems the behaviors that you see and it's 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 sort of like on the collective scale you know what we we're talking about in the top left culture of like individuals that are like have friction and dissonance and it's like not well aligned it's like oh there's some wisdom in there and some dissonance and like you run into problems yeah yeah if you're lacking context you know, eventually the entropy is gonna be is gonna accumulate because either either too much entropy is going in, or you're not dissipating enough entropy mm. out. Mm. Wild. So, you know, either people have dissonance and distortion that they're not that they're not um, you know making up for dissipating, or or um, you're not aligning with the outside world. Uh, you're not like synergizing with the outside world so so there's going to be friction and it's going to be grading hmm. what do you think would give rise to these new religions and new churches actually arising in the world like how how will that come about or could that come about so i'm not sure uh, i i think about this a lot um I think the, the foolproof way, but that's probably not fast enough, is just practicing it ourselves, right? It's it's like, you know, I'm trying to be a good friend to my friends and a good family member to my family members and inviting people for dinner and, and sort of getting a regular hangout going and a, a little bit of a culture. So the world, the, the word cult comes from like cultivating, right? So So like, the root is good because uh, you're growing something you're you're nurturing something and it grows and it gives fruit uh back so sort of cultivating that and to a degree you just need to do that right because if you don't do it from the bottom layer if you rest something a dunbar scale thing on just dynamics that don't work like you <laughs> uh it's gonna topple uh but at the same time if if we want to solve this in our lifetimes or like close to uh that's probably not all you need to do. Um, <clears throat> part of it, I guess, hanging on teapot is pretty good because uh, we're sort of we're fi figuring stuff out on our own or like in our local environment, and then we share our wisdom with people around, and we talk about the stuff we do, and and sort of this thing starts congealing a little bit, or the information at least is getting processed and, and turned into more hand level abstractions. Um, but I, I think there's going to have to be a, an effort of, um, of um, congealing stuff a bit with appropriate feedback mechanisms so that you don't get a, a, a frozen thing that then becomes inappropriate for the context, context later on. Um, but yeah, there's going to be an effort of that. And like, it's going to be an evolutionary process. It needs to, right? So it's going to... Uh, it's going to fail a lot and you're going to tweak it a lot until it st stops failing uh, at the thing that was failing and then it's going to fail at something else and, and you've got to keep doing this and hopefully you do this fast hmm. uh, i'm not super confident that we get this before you know agi apocalypse or something hmm. uh, some other x risk um wipes us out but you know in the worlds where x risk doesn't happen this needs to be happening uh so that we can flourish right so you know might as well work on this uh too yeah uh and i wonder if by you know the node about computational comp comparative computational theology i wonder if by getting better or like more rigorous uh abstractions on what's going on uh 
you know, like this diagram, right? And, and even, even more rigorous. Um, I wonder if we can just accelerate this process, right? If you have better frameworks, you can talk about more things with more precision. And, you know, A-B test more quickly, faster. Hmm. Also TikTok. Like if you, if you can spread doctrine on TikTok, that would be great. <laughs> like if, if doctrine can go viral, uh, and when I say doctrine, I just mean, you know, concepts or practices that need to be spread to be tried. Hmm. Uh, if you if you do that on TikTok, like that, that sounds fast enough. Hmm. What exactly is comparative computational theology? It's, um, it's just a silly name that I give, uh, sort of the, the ambient thing I do when I read about spiritual traditions which is um i find i find metaphors uh, i find computational metaphors for for these things um, mm. like this graph like a bunch of the stuff i've been talking about uh you know i'll be reading about buddhism and be like oh this sounds just like a markov blanket uh i'll be reading about christianity and thinking about the game theoretic aspects of you know forgiveness mm. right um, the the complex systems perspective on the Holy Trinity, how how the Holy Ghost is no how the Father is the principle uh, of agapic love, the Son is the implementation in each of us, and the Holy Ghost is sort of the emergent property uh, of you know the kingdom of God emerging from people actually implementing the agapic love. Mm. For example. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's dive into the bottom right cluster. Um, and I guess what I find myself drawn to is resistance capability and multi-scale organizing. Um, I don't know, just... Yeah, well, let's start with resistance capability. Like, why, why, why is that in there, and why would you be thinking about whether you can overthrow the state if need be or not? Feedback loops, <clears throat> feedback mechanisms. Right? It's like when you agree to solve your coordination problems by having a sovereign that um, you know sets the rules so that better equilibria um, arise. You can't act against the sovereign uh, unless it's baked into the rules, right? Unless you can vote them out or something. Uh, but you know, there's a million examples of democracies being slowly eroded or quickly eroded or captured by industry. Um, and so, you know, there, there, there's this diagram of, of like, what is it? Uh, it's like laws passed in the US, like I, I'm butchering this. This is from Radical Exchange. Um, hmm. It's a, uh, yeah, so it's like popular support and chance of no, popular support on the X axis and like uh, how like percentage of, of laws that were approved, right? Given their public support as a function of like public support. And the distribution is like flat. So it's like, uh, it doesn't ma matter whether the the measures wh whether the proposals actually have public support or not they, they just get passed so it's like the information isn't flowing from the bottom up right like if if there isn't a correlation between public support and decisions then the information isn't flowing from the bottom it, it's just being um the actions are just being taken by someone else so you need to be able to resist you need to be able to uh, exert power <clears throat> despite it being against the rules <clears throat> and that's you know why open source software and local first software and crypto and network states although you know <clears throat> i dislike the um, like biology's frame on it i honestly the, it shouldn't even be network state there uh, it should be just some like um non-geographical like network 
coordination, something like that. Like, because the, the term is associated with the book now. Anyway, uh, these things all um, <clears throat> offer coordination outside of a sovereign, you know, like a protocol um, or or just maintain local power uh, in the in the case of local first software uh, and open source software, they maintain like grassroots uh, ability to, you know, brew your own stack, right? Uh, another example would be, um, you know, having pretty developed um, sort of small scale industry, right? Like being able to have like a foundry in your backyard uh, or, or, or a chip. But, the, the the you know the um, the holy grail would be like having a chip manufactory uh you know in your village or whatever uh, a 3d printer in every neighborhood stuff like this hmm. right ways ways that you can just be independent not rely uh on an estate because if you need to to rebel then you can without taking too much of a hit to your well-being If does you were, yes, it does. It does. If you were going to update this diagram, it's been about a year mm -hmm. and change since you've made it. Uh, what, how would you update it? What would you change? Yeah. So I'm in the process of doing it now. Like not, not literally now, but I have the window opening open, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh i'd make the the scales more the scales more um obvious like right now they're just little labels uh as numbers on the nodes and i, I sort of want, wanted to make the scales an axis um along with like so it, it's intuitive to look at uh what else yeah I, i've learned about a few things uh since that I'd probably include with a bit more um, relevance, like the, the active inference stuff, for example. Um, a lot. I, I I have I have some more Buddhist background now, so I I, I have like metaphors I want to take from Buddhism, or, or or just distinctions and abstractions that I learned that make sense to to highlight as separate things. Um, what else? What else? So I, I'm in the process of doing it now. So, so it's not like I've solved it. But what bothers me about this one, for example, would be a good thing to think about. Uh, oh yeah, I guess the the um, the spatial disposition of this beyond just having clusters uh, isn't too helpful. You know, you can't look at it and see, oh yeah, this clearly fl flows from that, or clearly there's a bottleneck here. Uh, and I wonder if I can do a better job uh, at, at it being more like visually intuitive. And one more thing is probably making it more interpretable, right? Like at the beginning of the conversation, I was complaining about how this is mostly for me or, or the value of this lies mostly in me being able to access the gestalt of my ideas. Um, I'd want it to be a bit more of service um, if I can. So originally I was thinking about making this a worldly diagram, but I think it would be a huge worldly diagram. Uh, so, but you know, it's still on the table. Um, I've thought about, so I, I talked to this person who built this thing called um, the facilitators catechism which is it's like a design document so it's like a design document uh, it's based on military um, uh, communication uh, formats where it's like you need to be re really clear about what the state what the state is uh, what the what, what the goal is uh, what to do uh, if no for you know what to do if you can't contact headquarters again uh, you know what other actors are doing, so what you can expect. So it's like about about how how to communicate about achieving goals effectively, uh, and they made this book for 
project, right? It's it's called the facilitator's catechism because it's supposed to be for the facilitators of a collective pro uh, project, like an open source thing or a research collective uh, to sort of provide the document that other people can look at and understand where they can contribute, where they can start working, like who else is working on this? What are they working on? What's the, what's the high level goal? Uh, how, how do we know if the goal is achieved? Um, so yeah, like ha sort of making this, um, making this something you can contribute to without it becoming too um, like over stuff, over stuff like um, without being really overbearing and unmanageable and just becoming a, a big tangly ball. Uh, I'd love it. So, sorry, I, I keep adding stuff, <laughs> but I'd really love it if if um, downstream from this, people who don't know how their projects are connected could see how they're connected and, and could and could collaborate because they understand it. Right? I don't know if this is you know a diagram or a design document like I was mentioning it mentioning or if it's you know me going around and telling people you know uh, and i have my little materials that i can point to but it it's ostensibly an active job where you need to be like hey you you talk like being sort of a, a hyper connector at this level um i don't know it's these are things i'm exploring mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, i'd be very curious to see an updated version of this diagram or any further work that you did on it or how to share these ideas with the world. And yeah, I'm glad that we've gotten a chance to talk about it in some depth. Um, I wonder, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about or say more about? Mm. So I'm, I'm really glad that, that you invited me to do this because it gave me a chance to flesh these things out like I've never had. I, I haven't had a chance to, to really, you know, with someone go through all the clusters and, and sort of voice them, uh, voice my thoughts about them. So, you know, this was really useful for me too. Mm. In terms of um, stuff that I'd want to broadcast, um, I, I guess I just did like I, I was thinking at the beginning I was thinking about like setting an intention uh, or letting people know that like you know this is sort of what I'm trying to do right you know giving people a little bit of an interface but I think I just did that like, like the coordination function of you know either this diagram or something that I'm doing uh, actively I, I think that's like idea that I want to um, let people know that I'm trying to do um but yeah like beyond that um oh yeah okay uh can i ask you a question of course yeah so i i had prepared i i had prepared stuff about um asking about your company uh, mm. right but i i swear it's related uh to to the rest of the convo but it's like <clears throat> you're doing something that strikes me as really unusual right you're um you're a, a monk pilgrim uh and you're also a ceo uh and presumably you're trying to be of service and accomplish goals um and so yeah i, I guess i want to now now that now that you've gotten a chance to hear a bit about the diagram and maybe maybe uh have an idea of sort of how this works can you describe what you're doing in sort of mm. terms of the diagram mm. that's interesting well uh in some way i haven't talked about this publicly yet so i suppose this means that the cat will be out of the bag but um oh i'm so sorry no no it's okay it's okay i've been um i've been sort of cagey about it because i don't well for a few reasons but one of them is i don't really like the words 
that we have to describe it right now. And that, that that's like definitely related to the problem uh, is like, oh, is it really, it's not, it's not a company, it's not a nonprofit. I kind of imagine at some point it will be a nonprofit, but hard to say for sure. And um, we sort of metaphorically call it Tosh and Inc. Um, or that that's like colloquially what we call it. Um, but I, you know, I want to rename it at some point to something that's not just my name, but uh, uh yeah, how would I describe it in terms of this diagram? Um, I think basically we're uh, this is it's so it's so hard to talk about, but I think we're trying out a different social coordination mechanism for how to do work together in the world that's not um, using some of the assumptions that a lot of companies or nonprofits would use. So um, we're trying to find a way. I mean, I guess it's at the squad scale right now. It's like about eight or nine people and um, seem to have found like a stable way to coordinate at that scale where we're like doing work together that is having impacts in the world, but it's not uh, happening through a company or a nonprofit and um, isn't using some of the things that would be assumed there. Like so everyone is, I'm the only person doing full-time on my projects. Um, everyone is part-time besides me. And I don't pay anyone by default. There's no salaries. Everything is volunteer by default. And then if people uh, do projects that bring in money, then I split what comes in with them. Typically things are by generosity by default. Um, so that's you know, sort of a social coordination mechanism that comes from Buddhism, also other traditions, but, you know, I learned it from Buddhism. Um, some things that we do, we do commercially, but generosity is the default. And then, um, so either way, whether it comes in commercially or through generosity, I'll like split revenue with people. And people are doing that work because it's like aligned with who they are and what they want to do in the world and is sort of intrinsically meaningful to them. And it's like fun to work on that. That's how I think about it at the highest level is like fun service projects. Like let's do things that benefit the world that are also fun for us. So they're ideally intrinsically motivating because they're fun and interesting and also beneficial to the world. And so that's sort of the real, um, almost like currency rather than money. And then, you know, money, everyone has to be responsible for their own financial situation first and foremost and then they may also get money from the projects that we do but that's not the primary motivator and then um yeah i think i think i think that part of it is what's coming to mind is like teapot is really good for almost like a social scene and coordinating people who are just like, Hey, here's some interesting people to connect with and like learn what they're up to and like have good conversations and um, connect socially or like date people or, you know, other things. And then there's sort of a question of how to coordinate to do take actions in the world at the squad scale really. And um, there's a lot of people who are, as you say, very agentic in teapot who are like doing their own projects that are cool. And, and there might be like, there, there are some people that pair off in like, you know, two or twos or threes and go do a project together. That definitely happens. Mm -hmm. But like, how do you really coordinate at the squad scale or beyond? I, I'm, I'm curious from this conversation about the congregation scale, but like, how do you coordinate to do projects in the world if you're not interested in the like startup model or the company model or the, you know, I, I'm still interested in the nonprofit model, but um, a lot of nonprofits, to my estimation, are kind of um, scler sclerotic and like not working that well. And, but, you know, I, I've, I share some of the values of the nonprofit world. And so this is an experiment in how to coordinate, I'd say with seven, eight, nine people um, to do projects together in an ongoing sustainable way <clears throat> um, at that scale. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, we need more of that. We need m more experimentation in 
yeah different ways of coordinating because it feels bad, right like the the startup model just grinding and the equity thing and looking for vc funding and then you're beholden to vcs it just feels icky mm -hmm. right yeah yeah so, i think um for me personally like simplicity is a really important value for me personally and I think that that factors into the organization as well and like my own personal expenses are something like 24 to 36,000 US dollars a year. I don't know. I, I'm not, I need to do better math with that sort of thing, but it's, you know, it's something like 1500, $2,500 a month. That's really low. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the internet enables you to do pretty impactful service projects at a low budget, like this, you know, like I'm, we're on a Zoom call. I pay, you know, a certain amount a month to Zoom for Zoom calls. I have a microphone and a video camera and like, that's it. You know, it's, it's not, um, you know, a lot of the projects that I do are pretty low budget. And then the bigger ones, there's ways to scale them. So they're not like, you can do medium sized service projects with like pretty reasonable budgets that aren't like, you know, multi-million dollars a year kind of thing. And so I think that's a question as well as like, almost like frugality at the scale of um, squads and congregations of like, I think there's a lot that um, I mean, obviously startups have been very successful as a model, but like, I think there's room for more things to happen if people have different models of, yeah, it basically if money is not so important, you know, like money is not, has never been very interesting to me as a motivator. It's like, um, I know I'm not, I'm not living my life to maximize for money, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, the thing, so the thing that comes up for me is like, And this is probably, um, you know, partly a personal distortion that I need to address, but it's like this feeling of sort of lack of a safety net, right? So if you don't, if if you're working frugally on a project uh, without like a, a bit of a like financial padding, um, you're just in precarity. Uh, right so it's like you know you're trying to be true to your values but if you but you know you're stressing about paying rent or, or stressing about just covering your expenses and if the project doesn't work out for like more than six months uh then you need to you know just exit this kind of life completely and get a job working for the men uh but for me it's less of a problem than for for many people uh right but i can imagine for, for a lot of people it's like being experimental in these sorts of things um probably doesn't feel like an option mm -hmm. and i wish it yeah i think it isn't i think that's a really good point and um there's a lot of circumstances that have made it possible for me to do this and the people that i work with to do that and um you know some conditions that are definitely not well distributed at this point and um some of them are like yeah like i don't know i think um you know being young and having like some financial means you know i have enough money that i can probably float for like three six months i don't know six and i don't know math is not my strong suit but basically i'll be okay for a while to eat if i you know don't uh work out and um also having like i put a lot of time into um you know training myself and self-development where like i don't know i'm pretty uh resilient and like not everyone has learned all the different techniques and stuff and um and then i think i think being connected to a community like teapot is also i mean on the one hand anyone can sign up for Twitter pretty much and like create an account and stuff like that. And, but not everybody knows that that community is there. Or like, even if you know, it's there, it's not clear how to like participate in a way that like leads to the kinds of things that are possible for me right now. And so um, I, I was actually thinking about this recently, like, I guess, cause it's tax season over here in the States. And like, uh, it's like financially I'm quite poor, but like, I feel very rich in, ways that actually matter to me. Like, as I said, I don't really care about money. And, um, you know, I, I'm i below the poverty line from the government perspective. And like, yeah, that is, that is sort of risky. Like, 
I don't know. I, I'm just kind of trusting things will work out for me. But um, but I feel very rich in terms of like friends and like, um, you know, my own inner experience and like the people that I'm connected to and the kinds of things that are possible for me. I think I'm in, in the metrics that I sort of care about, like uh, the qualities that I care about of life, like I'm abundantly rich, you know, just like very rich. Um, and I feel I, I would definitely choose the ones that I'm rich in over money like any day. So I feel grateful for that. And uh, it and, and it's worth mentioning that that's definitely not um, something that people can take for granted. And like, you know, I don't have kids. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have student debt. You know, that's that is something that's those are all implicit and makes it possible for me. And I would hope that um, I think that the kind of coordination that I'm doing with the people that I work with, I think there is something novel there. And I would like to see that be distributed um to the extent that it it works but it, this is also a stage of like kind of proving that it works and um uh it's not obvious like we have to prove that it works before we can scale it but i think um hopefully by doing the thing and sharing the thing it will make it so that it's less rare that people can do this kind of work in the world yeah mm -hmm. and, and by sharing it you know itself by the thing you're doing being an experiment and creating new knowledge it's also like you can probably get a boost out of sharing it um, mm -hmm. people will be interested and it'll probably make up for it being a new thing or like at least alleviate the penalty you take for trying a new thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely definitely yeah um you know, and it's all, it's all, um, I think part of the thing that makes it work too, that is practical and worth passing on is like, um, these are people that I've built up strong relationships with where like, I know who they are and they know me and like, we know what we're trying to accomplish in life and like, um, building up those individual relationships such that it even makes sense to be like, Hey, you want to like form this into a like non-formalized working collective where we work on these projects for a long time like that is something that kind of makes sense to do and um in that shared context so um yeah basically building relationships with people makes that possible so yeah uh, anything else that you want to talk about no not right now great well thank you so much for uh joining me and bearing with my questions about this diagram and explaining it oh, in such no. careful detail Thank you for asking them. Mm. I, I really appreciate your interest in this thing I made. Mm. I, it, you know, you're the only person who, who, who's who been this interested. Mm. So, uh, well, we'll or, fix that, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it does mean a lot, right? Like, it, it's, it, um, it feels like being known a bit more. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful.